Well, if you would, take your Bibles and please open to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2 is where we find ourselves. If you are someone who needs a copy of the Scriptures, please let me know. We have them up here. We do not have any more sermon note-taking booklets, but we also have some Bibles in the back. If you're someone who needs a Bible, especially we have six Ryrie study Bibles that are in the back as well. So that'll be helpful. Uh, And if I say anything that Ryrie doesn't agree with, he's wrong. So that's good to know. Just kidding. So we are in Ephesians chapter 2. What is Ephesians about? Ephesians is about the unfathomable riches that are available to the believer in Jesus Christ. Paul writes this letter as a general, widespread, circulated communication. It has the name Ephesians because that was the closest manuscript that they had in doing that. But what this probably actually was was a cyclical letter. And that means that it was written down with such profound truths, but general truths. In fact, there's not even the name of another person that's written in there until you get towards the end, and that's because he's the guy running around handing the letter to all these churches. And so what would happen is a church would get this letter from Paul, they would read through it, and they would be encouraged to insert their name of their church in there. The church at Ephesus, the church at Portage, whatever. They would put it in there. They would pass along to the next group. In fact, if you do some research in the New Testament, you find out that this, this letter probably is more properly understood as uh, the epistle to the Laodiceans is what it is because Paul in Colossians refers to it and you have Colossians and Ephesians intersecting like that. He says, make sure you read that letter. Why is it? Because this talks about all that the believers have in Christ while Colossians talks about all that Christ is unto the believer. So you put them together, you've got a pretty amazing theology about what it is to simply be in Christ. Now last week we talked about what it was to be a workmanship. The fact that God is doing something by His grace, and He's got something specific for the church. We are His carefully crafted masterpiece. And if you remember, I put this up here because this is one of the closest things I could think of that a human could come up with of what would be considered beautiful and elegant and even poetic, and even purposeful, thought-provoking. Sometimes people could get emotional about that stuff. And I told you guys I had a copy of this in my house, and so last night I'm down in my basement and I'm studying. I thought, you know what, I'm going to take a picture to show them. And that's what it looks like. I love that picture, but not as much as I love books. So moving on. So if we're picking up in Ephesians chapter 2, We're going to start in verse 8 to get a running start. And this deals with the gift of by grace through faith salvation. God, in a justice perspective, is not obligated to save one person at all. We've said this before. He could take his hands off of civilization, let it play itself out, And every single one of us end up in the lake of fire, past, present, or future. And not one person could bring any accusation of injustice towards him at all. In fact, what we would say is, we would be getting exactly what we deserve and what we have earned in this life. That's a crazy thing to think about. But what's even crazier to think about is the fact that God has grace. And what grace means is whatever you deserve God has decided to give you the exact opposite of that. So while I deserve to try to pay for my sins and be in slavery forever and burn for eternity and gnash my teeth and have brimstone and fire everywhere and walk around and there's Satan in agony as well in this situation, what I'm actually going to get is perfection, glorification, in a place seated next to the Most High King for eternity. That's grace. I didn't do anything to earn it. In fact, I did everything to earn what I should have got. But I'm so glad He didn't give me what I should have got. He's given me what I shouldn't have got, and I got it. That makes sense? There you go. So notice, by grace... You have been saved, and notice that it's through one way and one way only. Let's not get it wrong. You cannot earn your way at all. 
So any time that you are searching for a reason to be vindicated, either before people or a holy God, to try to prove your case, stop, close your mouth, and get on your knees. Because the Lord is the one who justifies you for one reason only. When you believed in Jesus, everything that he accomplished now became yours in full. Do we need more of Jesus? Yes, we do. But that's in our thinking and daily life. Do you already have everything in Jesus? Yes, you do. And that's exactly how God sees us all the time. And the sooner that we recognize that we already have everything in Jesus and start living our lives that way, the sooner we start recognizing that the way that we act, think, and respond to people all of a sudden becomes part and parcel of who God says we are. This is why we call this abundant, uh, forgive me, our astounding station in Christ as we saw in chapter 1. It is every spiritual blessing freely given. But it comes one way, simply by believing when the gospel is explained. What is the gospel? Christ died for your sins and rose from the grave. Do you believe that? It's because of me he was on the cross. It's because of me that he had to die. But it's also in spite of me that he rose to live and he actually invites me to come and live with him. That's insane. So, notice it's not of ourselves. You know what that means? In the Greek, that means empty pockets. Just kidding. But that's what it is. Turn them out because you got nothing. Right? It's the gift of God, not a result of works. No works can do it. Why? Because if I can work, I will boast because I am human and I am sinful. For we are his workmanship. We are his masterpiece. Good grief. Who taught me how to spell? I have a hard college education. All right. We are his masterpiece. We're created in Christ Jesus. Now pause. We're created because this is brand new. Here's where we mess it up every time. The fact that we're created brand new in Christ. Old you is gone. I know you guys hear me say this over and over, but repetition is a good teacher. God's not interested in the old us. He can't use it. It's broken. It's sinful. And it needed to be crucified. That's the problem. He paid for our sins. He died for our sins. Sin problem is gone. Sin nature is another situation. Our sin nature must be crucified with Christ. Now, we're already crucified with Him as far as God is concerned. But we don't realize that. Why? Because when we get that crazy bill in the mail, we still respond the same way. When our kid's running around with that supposedly tightened lid on their cup, and they've actually got some way-colored crazy drink, and they're on the carpet going, blah! And that's why you flip out. And no, that did not happen to us. So stop thinking that, sinners, okay? I'm just giving a general example, but it didn't happen to us. But that's the reason why we respond. Not yet. <laughs> you know what? Our, 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 our Father has such a sense of humor that this afternoon some interesting things are going to happen. I can already tell. I can see it. What's going on? <laughs> so it's going to happen, right? Yeah. He's our prophet. But here's where we get this messed up at. We're brand new. You're brand new. I know you don't feel brand new. The problem is, is we don't think of ourselves as brand new. But that's where the stumbling block is. If we could just get ourselves out of the way and ask the question, what does God say? God says I'm brand new because I'm in Christ. That's the reason why I'm a new creature. And I start from there in my thinking. Life changes. All of your life changes. You stop living for the things of today and you start living for the things of eternity. And next thing you know, all the things that seem like a stranglehold where you could barely catch your breath become actually a place of absolute invitation because it's God saying, won't you just rest in me and let me do it? Our responsibility, trust. His responsibility, work. That's how it goes down. Okay? Now, for those of you who have gone to the potty recently, you know I've put up a new quote. Okay? Right? Nobody leave now. Okay? But everybody's like, what is it? I got to go. Don't do that, okay? Just chill. But next time you go, pay attention. What's going on? Created in Christ Jesus for good works. 
And remember, these good works are God's works. They're not my works. They're not my good idea. It's what God wants the church to do. Remember, this right here is in the singular. It's not in the plural. It's not that we're all masterpieces. No, it's that together we are God's masterpiece. And together we have been put in order to execute God's good works. Not my good works, not my good ideas, not this is where I think it ought to go. Any kind of claim, earthly, is gone. All of it is spiritual. All of it is heavenly. All of it is Christ desiring to work these good works through His church. So His church has got to operate by faith. Notice this. God prepared them beforehand. Why? So that we would walk in them. And walk, live. How I actually conduct my life. Now here's what's interesting. You step into verse 11, and all of a sudden it seems like two things. Number one, he's repeating himself back in verses 1 through 3 of this chapter in a different way. And number two, he starts dealing with what seems like a strange, odd subject. Therefore, remember, good Bible study. Anytime you see therefore, what is that therefore? Well, remember, the subject is the grace of God and the fact that the grace of God in salvation stretches beyond saving us. Does that make sense? No hell? Great. No lake of fire? Fantastic. Debt all completely gone? Yes, but God desires to do more, and He does it by His grace because we don't deserve any more than the grace He's already given us. Well, guess what? God loves to outgrace Himself in giving grace. That's what He does. He just graces me and graces me and graces me and graces us as a church. He graces you. Why? Because He loves to show grace. He loves it. He loves to keep giving more to us than what we deserve. Why? Because he desires for that intimate trust to be developed between his child and himself, between his church and himself. So no, notice this. Therefore, remember that formally, that's important, okay? You, everybody notice this. We've been paying attention to uh, the personally inclusive pronouns, okay? We've got to get rid of that for the moment. Because Paul is not including himself here. He doesn't say we. You, the Gentiles in the flesh. Everybody see that there? Very interesting. This is humanly speaking. We'll talk about what formally means here in a second. Who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision. So what is this? Gentile, we know that because the context is telling us, uh, sorry, there we go, right there, okay, notice that, Gentiles and circumcision by the so-called circumcision, now that's interesting, here's the reason why, because Paul is showing his spiritual gift of sarcasm, okay, By the circumcision which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Now does everybody see how in the flesh here and in the flesh here are together? This would have grated on a Jewish person's ears like you don't even know. Because what had happened was that the Jews over time, and especially in the first century during Paul's time, had become incredibly prideful in their heritage. And so this is why when you're reading about Jesus in his life and he's dealing with the Pharisees, you don't understand. We have Abraham as our father. You don't understand. We have the law of Moses. They didn't think much of Jesus as possibly being the Messiah, even though they knew that's who he was. They came to that conclusion. It's just that they rejected it and they acted in unbelief, and that's why they killed him. They wanted to get him out of the way. But this is why they kept latching on to all these points in the Old Testament of their Jewish heritage. You read the book of Hebrews from beginning to to end and you find one of the prominent themes that keeps going through that entire book is is these are christians who are thinking about you know what as a believer i'm getting beat up all the time because of my faith in christ what if i just kind of went back into judaism because the romans like that a lot and if i hang out in judaism i won't get beat up as much the writer in hebrew says if you go back to anything it's inferior to christ because all these things pointed to christ So you're being a hypocrite. Don't do that. Don't make that mistake. There's this underlying Jewish deservedness, this entitlement 
that held on to them. And this is why they would say such derogatory, derogatory things to the Gentiles is, well, you're part of the uncircumcision. Now you think, number one, eh, right? Okay, what in the world does that mean? That's gross. But period, or, or, or time out here. What this is dealing with is the idea, think back to David. Everybody remember David? Okay, Goliath is out there threatening Israel. David comes along with his picnic basket from his dad. And he's going to feed his brothers, some of the soldiers there, right? And he hears Goliath, why don't you come out here? What's the matter? Are you scared? Okay, he's hearing all that out there from this really tall dude. And David stops and he goes, what's wrong with y'all? Because David was from Kentucky, okay? He had some blue blood, I don't know. What's wrong with you all? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine who comes against the people of the Most High God? What is he saying there? This guy has no promises. This guy has no guarantee. He has no covenant with God. God has not taken the initiative to specially work with him and his group from Gath ever. Why are we scared? He has no protection. You know what's interesting about that? David, little boy. That means that when he looked over at Goliath instead of fear, here's what he concluded. This guy is defenseless and weak. Let's take him out. See, we don't think like that normally. What made David think like that? I've got the promises of God. So by him using that accusation against Goliath, there's the designation that he's making. The problem is, is that that ego That pride had become so inflated. Pride is never good. It became so inflated that at this point, they decided they would use it as a pejorative term. This is a derogatory slander against these people. What is Paul pointing out? If you think that you're more righteous or pious with God because of some sort of act or mark that was given to you out of human hands, you got another thing to think about because that's the most hypocritical thing ever. Why? Because what they were saying is, acceptance is based on their works. And he's saying you are wrong. So you can sit here and talk bad about Gentiles all day long and hate them and create race wars and whatever else that you want to with these people. Recognize this, your boat's no better. Your boat's got holes all in it and you're both sinking quick. So now let me read this. We're going to read 12 and 13 together. Okay, just see this, and then we're going to break it down. Remember that you, at that time, separate were uh, at that time. What, did I mess that up? Remember that you were. <laughs> thank you. Uh, at that time, separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now, watch this. Remember. This is how verse 11 started out with the idea, therefore, remember this, Gentiles in the flesh. Remember that you were, what is that? Formerly, at that time, formerly, beforehand, you had a big problem. Number one, you're separate from Christ. Now here's what's interesting. You say, doesn't everybody start out in life separate from Christ? Well, yes, but that's not what Paul's talking about. The fact that he directs the argument to the Gentile audience for just a second is he's trying to create in their minds the extent of God's grace. He is trying to take them and say, you don't realize just how maybe destitute you were previously and what God has done through Christ in order to bring you into this gracious position. So he says you were at that time separate from Christ. Anybody know what Christ means in the New Testament? Christos? Anybody know? What's that? Perfection? No. Anointed one. Who said that? Mary did. Mary, do you like cheeseburgers? I'm telling you, you guys got to come cash in these cheeseburgers. Anointed one, which translates when you have a Hebrew mindset too. Messiah. That's what Mashiach means in the Hebrew. It means the one who is anointed of God. The Mashiach, the promised Messiah. Now think about that. Here's what he's saying in contrasting Jews and Gentiles here for a second. Gentiles, guess what you didn't have? You didn't have a Messiah. Pause for a second. 
no Messiah. Everybody remember the first gospel? Genesis 3.15? The whole situation goes down. Everybody's blaming each other and everybody else. And it's the snake who did it, right? That kind of stuff's going on. And God says something very profound when he's pronouncing this curse out to Satan. He says, this deliverer is going to come. You will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. Promising deliverance there. Guess what? They didn't have anything else after that. They had no development of what it was to actually have a savior, to actually have the promise of a king. The birth announcement to Mary through the angel Gabriel would have meant absolutely nothing to a Gentile. Why? They had no previous history. From Genesis 1 through 11, God is working with the entire world. And after the Tower of Babel incident, God decides to work in a different way. And so he pulls back out of human history. Not that he wasn't aware, not that he wasn't even involved. But the narrative of the Bible pulls back and says, you know what God's going to do? He's going to pick one guy. One guy who was actually worshiping the moon god at that time. Got his attention and said, get up from where you are. Go to a land I'm going to show you. You're not going to know it until you get there. And I'm going to give you blessings that are absolutely unparalleled. And through you, I'm going to make a brand new nation. And so Abram gets up out of what was later to be known as Babylon. So the central seat of where demons love to hang out. Pay attention to, to, to it today, guys. Okay, it's a hell-infested place. Get ready. In fact, I don't know if you've seen this. The United States has actually just pledged money to help rebuild Babylon after what happened with Saddam Hussein. Dude, we're in there thick, okay? Yeah, stars and stripes, we're getting in trouble here, guys. We are. It's dangerous. So, they decide to leave there. He travels over, and he takes up residence there, and he receives something called the Abrahamic Covenant and starts this brand new people known as Israel. In fact, look at this. Take a moment with me and turn to Deuteronomy 7. I want to show you this. Just to mark it in your Bible, just to see. If you never spent any time in the Old Testament, spend more. You learn a ton. This is talking about when the children of Israel are going to come into this pagan land. They're going to destroy everything so that there's no demonic influence upon them anymore. And God makes an incredible reminder on these people. Remember who you are as far as God is concerned. Here's what he says about the Jews. Chapter 7, verse 6. For you are a holy people to Yahweh, your Elohim. Uh, Yahweh, your Elohim, has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of the peoples who are on the face of the earth. The peoples on the face of the earth, those are the Gentiles. God chose the Jews out of this situation as a people for himself. He says here, verse 7, Yahweh did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all the peoples. But because Yahweh loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your fathers, and those are the covenants, we're going to deal with those later, Yahweh brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Does everybody see that the only reason why the Jews were ever God's chosen people is because God loved them? It's the same motivation for why he has saved us now in Christ. It's, God, it's God's love that pushes him beyond any form of merit or deservedness and causes him to reach into the dark pit and rescue people out of it. And he's drawn them unto himself. Now you say, why in the world did he do that? He did that because when he gave them the law, he was setting up a society in such a way that would radiate holiness amongst the nations. And the evangelistic program there was by having this society that so represents God and His holiness in fullness and obedience. Not that they were perfect, but when they messed up, they handled their sin and their problems God's way. In doing that, they were to shine to all the nations and so draw all the nations to come and inquire about God. The evangelism of the Old Testament was the idea of becoming inward focused and drawing people in. The church has brand new marching orders in Jesus Christ of the fact that we're to be going out and sharing the gospel with every person that we meet. Those would be the two differences between Israel and the church in that matter. Notice that God loved them, God chose them, God had a special purpose for them. Nothing of their own, it's simply His grace. And that is the theme that is threading through this. You can go back to Ephesians now. Ephesians 2. It's a good place to know. If you, it solves a lot of problems, it seems like, for people to know where that's at. It says, notice at that time you were separate from Christ. 
no Messiah, no Savior, no Deliverer. In fact, could anybody think in the Bible about what Gentiles did as far as worship? How about Egypt? Are we familiar with Egypt? Does everybody remember the situation with Pharaoh? Does everybody remember that Moses shows up? He's been gone for 40 years, right? Heck of a furlough. But he shows back up, and he comes in there because God has commissioned him. He says, Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh says, who's this God that I should listen to him? I kind of picture him talking like that, right? Who is this guy? Kind of thing. He's the God who created all things. I'm not going to let these people go. And if you remember, there's a series of plagues that take place. And if you remember when you're here, when we walked through each one of those plagues, each plague addressed at least one, if not more, of the pagan gods that they worshipped. And why did they worship them? Number one, pagan gods are actually demons in disguise. Number two, it was by works that they thought that they could appease these demons as so to get blessing. See, this is what pagan Gentiles do. They work for their salvation. They work for their acceptance amongst the spiritual. So notice that these ramifications of not having a Messiah played themselves out. Number one, people have got to worship. They can't help it. They worship something, right? Right? Every single person in here worships something or someone. They do. I'm deciding whether or not to lay hands on him or not. We might want to cast something out, Jay. I'm not for sure. Okay, so forget Jay said that. Let's move on. But the fact is, is that Israel always had a deliverer. Even though for 430 years in slavery, they had temporarily maybe forgotten that. When Moses came back around, he started stirring all these old emotions because they were all rooted in the truth that God had revealed. Well, think about that, having that hope, which would give you the wherewithal to want to move forward. Under that hope, Gentiles, nothing. Not a thing. How about this next one? Notice at number two, they're excluded. If you have an ESV, good grief. L, stay there. Alienated, I cannot spell. Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. It's staying there now. Praise the Lord. Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. This is not just, hey, you're a Jew. Good job. That's not what it is. In fact, Abraham had many descendants if you go back and you trace his lineage. But what you found is it was only the ones from Abraham to Isaac, from Isaac to Jacob, and from Jacob unto his 12 sons with the ones that received the special privileged promises. Abraham had many other kids. In fact, we know that Isaac had another child, Esau. But yet he was not the child of chosen promise. God had a specific way he was going to bring it all about. Well, where were the Gentiles in this entire situation? Completely removed and oblivious, living their lives in their paganism. That's where they were. Had no time for this. No privileges, no blessings whatsoever. Uh, Let me see here. Let's do this real quick. If you want to write this down, you can. Romans 9, verses 3 through 5. This is really interesting. Let me briefly give you the background on it. Paul just got done in Romans 8. How many people love Romans 8? Just at the end of it, nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. And you want to stand up and go, yeah, right? You get all manly all of a sudden. So notice that. That's a really great thing that we can never be separated, a a fantastic security verse. But then the question becomes, if nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, how come the Jews aren't getting saved? Why is that? Paul says, I've got unceasing anguish in my heart. I could wish that I myself were, that word is anathema. The Catholics love it. Separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites. I would almost wish if I could, which the end of Romans 8 tells you that he can't, go to hell for the sake of Jewish people coming to faith in their Messiah. I would go to that length if I knew that the nation would be saved in that. And so the whole thing that you're dealing with there is, what in the world is Israel's problem here? Well, notice what he says about them as far as benefits from being the commonwealth of Israel, being this united front. Notice what they have. That belongs the adoption of sons. Let's just name them. One, or number them. One, adoption of sons. 
Number two, the glory. Number three, the covenants. Number four, the giving of the law. Number five, the temple service. Number uh, six. Six becomes before five in Kentucky. I don't know. Six. There we go. The promises, whose are the fathers, and from whom? Seven. God's number. There you go. Is Christ according to the flesh? Why is that? Because it came through the tribe of Judah, who is overall God blessed forever. Amen. Seven things that were privileges that fueled their nation about what they know from God. Special revelation that he reached down and undeservingly drawled to himself and said, here, know all these wonderful things that I'm going to do for you and through history in the future. Can you imagine? And here are the Gentiles separated from this whole thing. What were the privileges that they had? Good grief. In fact, whenever it comes time for Moses to stand in front of Pharaoh, uh, when it comes time for Moses to stand in front of Pharaoh, he says, Yahweh says, let my son go. Speaking of Israel. It's personal. It's family. And God took it very personally. And that's the endearment that he has for those people. They have all of this. These are the privileges they have. What does a Gentile have? None of this. None of it. We don't know what it is to be in temple services. We don't know what it is to have a scapegoat that's sent out into the wilderness and another goat set aside for a sin offering. We don't understand why in the world the Jews are so after an unblemished lamb. Why? This is all foreign talk to us. You might say, you know what, this is foreign talk to me right now. That's why we have the Old Testament. The Old Testament sets the precursor for the Messiah when he shows up. If anybody should have believed this and been looking for it, it was the Jews. Why? Because they had such a panorama of truth available to them. And instead they went, I'd rather go do temple services. We're good with God. Check that off our list. Let's go home and watch football. That's what they did. No good. Notice also that they were strangers to the covenants of promise. These covenants, let me give them to you real quick. I'm I'm praying about whether or not we need to cover them. The Abrahamic covenant, number two, the priestly covenant, number three, uh, which is different um, because it's conditional, the Mosaic covenant, also known as the law, Um, number four, the Davidic covenant, and number five, and I'm doing a ton of research on this right now because I'm unsettled, the new covenant, this right here, is the basis of promise. These three right here are fulfilled in this as well as this. So one is the basis, two, three, and four are all ones that also fit in there. Five, the new covenant, is the full manifestation of God bringing everything exactly as he said, literally, to completion. I'm debating, I'm wrestling with whether or not we're going to cover that. But what are the covenants of promise? The word covenant, real quick, my Sunday school people, tell me, what does the word covenant mean? Contract, thank you. It is God setting himself forth, making a promise and guaranteeing it by an oath that it will come to pass exactly as he said that it would. Now you're sitting here saying, wait a second. If part of who God is is being righteous, why in the world would he need to go to such lengths if he's not going to lie to us anyways? Well, two reasons. Number one, we don't always believe God. I don't know if you understand that or if that's ever happened to you. But when God talks sometimes, we just don't believe him. For some reason, we've got better reasons or more clout in some sort of argument that should trump whatever God has to say. And therefore, it makes us more right. Well, that's not true at all. We need to relearn this whole thing. But number two, God is putting his very reputation on the line. He is laying it out for people saying, if this doesn't come true, I'm not God at all. It's very personal to him to set himself out here. What else is interesting is notice because they are covenants of the promise, notice that they are made with Israel only. The church has no covenants made with it. None. None at all. 
In fact, the only place where we show up at any of this is when God tells Abram, and through you, the nations of the world would be blessed. Who are the nations? The Gentiles. That's about as close as we get. Everything else is a promise between him and Israel. This is why you've got to pay attention to the Middle East. You've got to pay attention to what's going on there. Moving on, notice. Sorry, this was number three here. Notice here, number four, having no hope. Without Jesus, without the promise of some Messiah, we may not know his name, how are you going to save yourself? Well, man, I don't even know that I need saving. I'm just going to tune in, turn off, and drop out. That hit a nerve with some of you? Think about that. Have you ever just stepped back and observed how the world's trying to save themselves today? We can't be content with anything. Everything's got to get changed. Everything's got to get better. Well, that's no longer new. That's old. This is what's this year. We are incredibly wanting people. Why? No hope. None. You know, everybody ever heard somebody respond, well, it's just life's just you pay your taxes and you die. Wow, what a life, man. Forget that. Really? The IRS holds my future? Good grief. All right. But notice this also. Here's the problem. Without God in the world. And how do we know that that's true for Gentile civilizations? Because they've tried to formulate everything to replace Him. We know that there's a vacuum. We know there's a hole, and we've tried to do whatever we can to fit something. Because I know it ought to be there. Now we've messed this up royally as the church. Understand this. Because what we've done, we've come in this situation, is we step back and we said, you know what? By grace through faith is way too easy. Let's get some works in there. So we really see that what happened was genuine. And I say, stop it. It's none of your business. It's between God and that person. If you're faithful in presenting the gospel and they've responded in faith, it's a done deal. Now encourage them and disciple them and love them even more. But stop all this judgment of this stuff. We have filled ourselves with many things and understand this. If they've taken God out of the picture, it is this. I'm going to say this. You can think I'm crazy. Don't send me any hate mail. I won't answer you, okay? but recognize the narrative that's being played out. A year ago, NASA hired 30 clergy members, none from a conservative Bible-believing background, but people who have cloths and sometimes pose as penguins, I guess. I don't know. But moving on, brought them together to answer this one question. Could you guys have a series of meetings and we'll pay you a whole lot of money if you can answer this? What will be the response of the world if they find out that alien activity is actually true? And we're starting to see the little layers of the onion come back. Well, there's been a sighting. Well, we think there might be a mothership. Church, don't be fooled. Demons. Don't sell it short. Don't think that it's too fantastical and opt for Star Trek over the book of Ephesians, please. Recognize that Satan's job is deceiving the nations. It's what he loves to do. And he's getting ready to pull a full one over on everybody. Now think about this real quick. Put it all together, folks. Why in the world would Satan be moving in this direction at this time? Time is short. He knows the Bible better than we do, let's be honest. And he knows that believers in Christ have not been destined for wrath, but for rapture. So there's got to be some sort of explanation when we're taken out, when we're no longer here. Why? Because Gene Roddenberry told him 50 years ago, they just, they all left on a transport. It's those aliens that took them out of here. Somebody's going to step back and be like, How did Christians get so cool that all the aliens wanted them? You got to tag it on somebody, right? Recognize it's going to further this opportunity for demonic activity, greater deception, to believe in delusions because they've rejected the truth. And when we leave, the indwelling Holy Spirit leaves with us and the world becomes hell on earth. 
recognize this. This shouldn't be new. It's all been in the Scriptures for 2,000 years. So this whole idea of creating a substitute God that is coming from this demonic activity, we just happen to live in a first world country and we need greater distractions. Kevin. Yes. Use your time wisely. Mark in your Bible. Leave your notes out when you leave the house just in case. I'm excited for whenever lost people break into this place after the rapture. And they'll be like, who in the world accumulated all these books? Because Pastor Steve's library is in the library and mine is in my office. If you can't learn something from that, you're dumb. Good grief. Leave notes. Leave notes for people. Gosh, I'm excited for the rapture. I'm not looking forward to anything else, really. Let's just bring it, man. Okay, moving on here. Here's what I love. And, and, and I, all that was introduction for this. Here we go. But now, let me explain to you what now is. Now is the dispensation of the church. The church was born, Acts chapter 2, with the coming of the Holy Spirit. Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. He gloriously was raised by the power of the Father from the dead. He gave them teaching about the kingdom of God. He was then ascended up into heaven. And something brand new began at Pentecost with the church. And this is where we find ourselves right now. Now, I know I said this all throughout our spiritual gift series. Get this. We are the most privileged people in all of biblical history. We are. Why? Because we know about the cross. We know about the Savior. We know that Jesus has a name. We can actually name him. We also have the indwelling Holy Spirit. I tell you the truth, guys. It's to your advantage that I go up and go away. Why? Because I'm going to bring the Comforter to you, and the Comforter is going to indwell every person that's believed in Christ. And He is the seal that your redemption is guaranteed. So, but now is a 180-degree turn into this brand new dispensation of the church. How do I know that? Because that place is found here where it wasn't before, in Christ Jesus. And this is the glorious location brought up no less than 13 times in chapter 1 that we went over. In Christ, in Him, in the Beloved, through Christ. All of those things were brought up. We now have this in Christ standing. We're now there, spotless and perfect in God's sight. Now notice this. Who formerly, you who formerly, now notice, Gentiles, before Jesus came on the scene and got involved and died for our sins, you who formerly were far off, right, no revelation from God have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Why does he bring this up? Sometimes we forget how bad off we had it. We get very complacent and prideful in where we are now. We may have a lot of knowledge about it, but it doesn't always flesh out here or here. Sometimes we have allowed the idea of Christianity to venture into politics. Understand we are completely wrong in sin, in, in sin for that. You say, man, that's a really strong statement because of the way I feel about the world and the government and all that. Recognize, your king doesn't live here. Okay? He doesn't need to be elected and we don't need a majority vote to happen. If we did that, it wouldn't go our way anyway. Recognize this, he is the king. He is waiting for the father to let him ascend the throne. All things will be put under his footstool. But when we were in such a destitute position, God got involved and decided that with all the revelation that the Jews had, he would take those who had none and he would be able to bring them into an equal footing. And if they respond to how he did this, he would insert them in this brand new thing called a new man, a new creation in Christ. His masterpiece, the church, the body of Christ. This isn't the fact that Gentiles now become Jews or they now become Israel or that Israel is considered the New Testament church. It's got nothing to do with that whatsoever. It's Jew and it's Gentile unbelieving. But if they become a believer in this dispensation, they now become something brand new. And they can throw off the hostilities and the previous affiliations that they had because they are brand new creatures, one location, in Christ. How did it happen? By His blood. By His blood. 
Jesus actually had to stare down the knowledge of the cross in the face and recognize that he was willingly taking upon himself the wrath of God against all sin at one time and die. We don't deserve that. To ransom for us. The blood actually draws us near. In fact, I would say this, the blood actually beckons us. How do we know that? John chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus says, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. The time that that was spoken, that was prophetic. Why? Because the Jews had all this revelation, and they're like, "Eh, so what? The Gentiles were like, we don't even know what you guys are talking about. Guess what? Jesus dies. Now they can come in contact with the gospel message. Why? Because when he died, he died for everyone. That means every single person is the perfect candidate to be saved. The question is, is have they heard the message? Number two, have they responded in faith to the message? So what do we do? We tell them the message very clearly. Bring up the blood. Let them know about the blood. Why? Because blood had to be paid because it should have been my blood that was paying for it. Jesus takes my place. He hangs on the cross in my place. We call it substitutionary atonement. He dies in my stead. And what does he do? He liberates me from all wrongdoing as far as God is concerned. Some people wonder their whole lives, man, I just don't want God to be mad at me. God is not mad at you. He's not. Even when you fail and mess it up royally, he's still not mad. How do you know that? Because he already died for all your sins. The issue between you and him was already settled on Calvary. Anything left. It's all onward and upward for here. Do this with me, please. Turn to 1 Peter 1. I actually wrote down five different passages because I wasn't for sure where we were going to go when we got to this point. It's kind of like those books where you choose your own ending, how it's going to play out, you know. Do you take the blue car or do you take the truck? Uh Uh-oh, you know, those kind of things. Look at 1 Peter. Peter is writing to believers. Look what he says in verse 17, chapter 1, verse 17. If you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each work. Now he's talking about how we live our lives in the judgment seat of Christ here. Conduct yourselves in fear during your time of stay on earth. Does that mean I'm supposed to be afraid of everyone? No. It means that we are to live in such a way as to we reverence God first and foremost beyond anything else. Nothing is to scare us, move us, or deter us or try to determine our end for us. Nothing is to dictate our choices. It's God and God alone, period. It is Christ ever before us, no matter where we look. Now watch what he says here. He gives you a reason. Watch the basis for such an attitude in this life. Verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from your futile way of life. How did you live before you knew Jesus? How many? Raise your hand if you were fun. Yeah, you guys know we're going to have a conference later and embarrass each other to no end, right? Raise your hand if you weren't fun. Praise the Lord for you too. I love it. You don't understand. He took whatever you thought was important in your previous before Jesus life and he actually ascended you way beyond that. He made all that look like futility and foolishness to you. Look what he says here. You were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold. Man, we're dealing with this idea of an economic crisis as far as money is concerned. The one world currency is on the table. It's coming this way. Digital currencies. We're going to have to IDs to buy anything. What does all this do? Set the stage for the mark of the beast. Guess what? A lot of countries are having to revert back to where they should have been at the beginning of the 1900s, dealing with the idea of a gold standard. Federal Reserve has messed all that up. Thanks a lot, people. Right? Thanks a lot, government, for that one. Research the, re- research the Federal Reserve sometime. Interesting. Not even a federal agency. Some of you didn't even know that. That should be enough to move you forward. What's that? There's no reserve. Yeah. Where do they get all the money? Thin air. Yeah. Y'all talked about hot air? They got thin air. And it's hot. All right, moving on. But notice here. You weren't redeemed from silver and gold. The most precious things that we could establish all of our monetary value on, guess what? As precious as that is, That's not what was paid for you. Look what he says here. 
He says you inherited that feud away from your forefathers. Verse 19. But with the precious, what is it, church? Blood. Don't be ashamed of the blood. The precious blood of a lamb. Unblemished. Perfect. No stain. And spotless. The blood of who? Christ. Your Messiah. Your Savior. Your Redeemer. Your Deliverer. Why should I live holy? Recognize. The basis isn't because somebody gave a calculable amount to buy you out of who you used to be. It's the fact that Jesus gave His life for you. That He might give His life to you. And that was secured by His blood. It was all secured by the blood. Now, if you're in here and you don't have any sort of Jewish background, you classify as a Gentile. I don't know about you, but if verses 11 and 12 were my previous estate, I have nothing but absolute joy for the grace of God in reaching forward through the cross and saying, come to me, you're mine. Come to me, I want you. Come to me, the doors are absolutely wide open. Please accept my invitation to know me forever. So I don't normally do this, but it so happens that I have a streak of Baptist in my spine. Let me go to my last slide because I took the time to think about this. Jesus gave His life for us that we might give His, that He might give His life to us. And He did this by His own blood. You may be here today. I know most of you. But I don't know all of you. But the fact is, there is no more important question to ask is, Am I going to heaven when I die? There's not one. Do I actually have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Recognize this. He came and He died as a man in exchange for everyone. The payment has been paid. Whatever strife you have with the Creator, He set Himself forward and He dealt with it. Don't everybody zip up your Bible cases just yet. I could keep preaching if I want, okay? I have the mic. Good. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. What about Jay? Okay, yeah. I figured as much. All right. It's okay. But recognize this. There is no shame in coming to the cross. There's no shame in admitting your need. Men... You're not strong enough to pay the price for your sins. You need a Savior. Ladies, your husbands cannot affirm you enough and they can't sweet talk you enough to redeem you. It's impossible. There's just not enough self-esteem to be had to warrant an eternity with God. Recognize this. God knows this. God knows this. I'm not done. Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Pay attention to God's heart in this matter. Psalm 103, look at verse 8. Yahweh is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will He keep His anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. He has not. Think about it. What do you deserve? Apart from a Savior, what do you deserve? More than death. You deserve the lake of fire. Why? Because that's the only acceptable place for people who don't have life to go. They're dead. Dead. Separated from God. He does not, does not deal with you according to your sins. Look what he says nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. In other words, he doesn't say, here's how much sin you ran up on the tab. Let's get that tab evened out here. Let's settle up. God is not about settling up with us. God is about taking the debt upon himself and finalizing it. That's what he's about. Notice it says here, verse 11, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, So great is His loving kindness towards those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, 
so far he has removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children. Notice the tender mercy of God. So Yahweh has compassion on those who fear him. Here's the reason why. Look at this. Pay attention. For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. Why does God cast your sin away in opposite directions so that it never meets you again? Because He knows you need Him. Because He knows you have no other hope. Because He knows there is no other Christ. Because He understands that if we've been living in this world, we have bought a lie, hook, line, and sinker. And we've told that everything will save us except for the very thing that will. And that is Jesus and Jesus alone. So recognize the blood, the blood, the blood. What makes me accepted before God? It's the blood because I didn't bring anything. It's His blood because it couldn't have been mine. My blood is worth nothing. His blood is worth everything. And notice that God decided it's worth it. I want them. I love them. And they can't do it on their own. They will never do it on their own. They will never even be able to approach the foot of the mountain of Mount Sinai. They can't even do it. If they did, does everybody remember that in the Old Testament? What happens if they approach the mountain? What'd they do? They died. Why? That's all they could do. Recognize this. Apart from Jesus, all we can do is die. And that's it. Do you know Him? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Have you believed in Him? Let's make it real simple. God loves you, and God gave Jesus for you. That if you believe in Him, you will never Enter into the lake of fire. It's not even a possibility on your radar anymore. But He will give you His very life, eternal life, forever. Why do people go to the lake of fire? Because they don't have God's life. How do you get God's life? Jesus died to give it to you. He gave His life for you that He might give His life to you by His blood. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, I pray that today is the day of salvation. That this will be settled once and for all. That all lack of confidence, all false assurances, all failing hopes, every inch of mistrust would be laid down and buried for good because Jesus Christ has died for our sins and risen from the grave. This is our only hope. This is the hope that You have freely provided. Freely to us, cost you greatly. But isn't that exactly how your grace works? Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us a way out. And if there is anywhere, right now, online, in this room, that can hear my voice that is never trusted in Christ, today is the day of salvation. Believe in Him and we will be saved. Why? Because His blood is the precious payment to set us free, to take us onward and to take us upward and to separate us from this sinful, hell-stricken world and to bring us unto an eternity of glory in His presence. Father, move upon our hearts if we have not taken the blood seriously. Thank you, Jesus, for Your grace. In Him's name we pray.